Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your presence and uh, uh, to, uh, thank um, Open for the invitation for this presentation. And as uh, Thorsten told, uh, the idea here is to, I'm not going to present a review on the data uh, regarding uh, neuroimaging in, uh, uh, because a lot of, of you have, are, are studying this and published these studies. The idea here is uh, from the standpoint, from a particular standpoint of a clinician uh, who wants to work with it and is planning a, um, a trial to study the question of alcoholism and the, how we can use ayahuasca in a therapeutic fashion for that. So looking at the data that is available, so there's obviously a bias. Um, what's, I, could, I, I think it would be interesting to share with you so we could discuss and we could perhaps question some points about the literature and see mainly uh, potential uh, uh, paths for the future. So for that, you have to understand who I am. I'm going to be quite short about it, but it's important because it's, it's a filter that you have to understand uh, regarding my point of view. So I'm a clinician and I'm, I'm, I came to this, uh, I mean, this field of, to, of uh, psychedelic studies uh, Primarily by practice, and, and by practice I'm not talking about as a clinician. I, I went w into one of the ayahuasca religions of Brazil and stayed there for quite a while, and I quit for three years now. But it gave me, um, of course, a strong impression about the um, effects that the brew has. And uh, obviously, uh, for a long time, I've been interested in the team of, psychedel of psychedelics. But uh, it wasn't really an option for a, an academic like for my age at that time in Brazil to work with that. So I, 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 I come late to this field. And I, I've been working in the public health field for a while. So this perspective of a neuroscientist is under construction. So I'm not really a, a neuroscientist, and I would like to um, listen from you and um, probably not uh, right after the, 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 the talk, but uh, 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 as soon as we finish, we can talk here, and if you have any ideas, and, and I thank you for that as well. But I have a potential conflict of interest in this, in, because we are, we are named to, we asked to name them, because I got a, a grant from the Brazilian Ministry of Justice to investigate ayahuasca on, on uh, substance disorder, and we're going to work with uh, alcohol-related disorders. And also, I am a political activist. I have a, a standpoint in Brazil uh, regarding the legalization and the reform of drug laws. And I am a, a, a campaigner against the, draw, the, the drug, uh, drug war, the war on drugs. So this is also important to keep in mind. Uh, of course, I'm a scientist, but uh, we all have perspectives. We all have opinions. And I think it's important that you know that I have one and which one is mine. So addiction matters. You know about it, you have heard about it. There is a famous paper uh, in 1997 that says that addiction is a brain disease and it matters. And we do know that addiction has a strong burden in, in the public health system, in lives of people, in many situations. But I would like to add, and quoting a lot, another, another paper, paper not so famous from 2013 that says that addiction matters but it's not only a brain disorder. I think it's very important that we keep that in mind. And of course, I'm not rejecting uh, any neuro whatever. Um, these neuro whatevers are there, and we have to study them. But we are talking about very sophisticated, or at least complicated, animals, humans. So uh, we are socialized. We have a lot of. We, we have a psyche, and sometimes it's not so easy to assess that just using a machine. So we have also to get in touch with that with our human skills as well. And I think this is important to state that as well. So we have, we have had encouraging results. We can really say at the moment with uh, the data that we have available that addiction can be treated in, I mean, in the uh, uh, upper standards of, of uh, what we consider an evidence. But we have encouraging results for many um, um, drugs, uh, we have evidence for alcohol, from the old LSD studies, we have uh, open studies with ayahuasca, with psilocybin, 
We have anecdotal uh, reports about uh, ritual use of peyote. So, and also we have an open study with tobacco. And we have um, uh, evidence as well, but basically from anecdotal stories and mainly from ritual use from pro for polydrug abuse. And I'm not including Ibogaine in this story because basically um, it's too complicated to talk about Ibogaine in this situation. I'm being very sincere. Uh, and also because I chose to work with classic psychedelics, and I'll talk about the certain energic exclusively or more strongly serotonin energic, uh, and I'm talking about 2A receptors, um, uh, substances. And MDMA, as you know, it's, it's sometimes it's classic, classified as, as a psychedelic, sometimes not. In this case, I'm not including it, because I decided also to work uh, with psychedelics that we have no evidence of physical or any kind of strong addiction, and we, know, we do know that there is MDMA addiction, although rare it is possible to exist. So the question is, what insights about addiction treatment can we gather from neuroimaging studies with classic psychedelics in humans? And this insights, insights I'll, say, I'll say it again, from a clin clinician's perspective. First of all, these studies that I'm going to present to you, they were not designated to, uh, el to elaborate or to discover uh, how psychedelics might act on addiction. So, this obviously is the derivation that I'm doing, I'm aware of that, so we have to be cautious about it. And it does show, at the end, I'm going to say that again, we have to have new studies that focus on this question, of course. Um, and we have plenty of knowledge gaps, and it's important that we, we are aware that there are knowledge gaps in this field, in, in the neuroscience field, we have a, a lot to know. That's why this field is exciting, it's because it's so, so much we have to learn, we still have to learn. And as my friend Draulio, who's here, likes to talk a lot, we have to be careful with the interpretation of this data because they are fascinating. They are fascinating, they are dangerous. They are dangerous because we are dealing with two things, beauty and ignorance. And sorry, Draulio, if you are going to say that tomorrow, but anyway, <laughs> I love this quote. <laughs> Uh, so what we have here uh, so far, uh, with this criteria, we found 25 uh, studies uh, with a time frame that comes from uh, 1992 to 2016, like a month ago or something. And we included mescaline, and here we're talking about mescaline, not peyote, and psilocybin, we're talking about the this, this substance. Uh, LSD, the, this last study, uh, recent study, and ayahuasca that, as you know, I'm not going to, into the pharmacology of ayahuasca, but it's a natural product with a mix of uh, active ingredients, very complex. Um, about the techniques, we basically, uh, all, all we have available at the moment, uh, so we have PET scans, scans we have uh, SPACTs, um, EEG and its variations, topographic EEG mapping, magnetic encephalography, um, of course, uh, uh, fMRI. And um, we also have some um, uh, mixed, uh, mixed model studies. That we, the, uh, uh, and actually, we have one, this last LSD study, uh, mixed uh, more than one technique, which is also very interesting. And not only that, but we have the, a lot of papers that come, more than one paper come from the same experience. There's one, class, one particular experiment with uh, injected psilocybin that had a lot of branches and uh, reanalysis in terms of sophisticated uh, analytical methods. So very quickly, uh, um, some points I think are, it's important that we mention when we're talking about this subject. Uh, first, the drug. Um, Obviously, I, I can't go into detail about everything I'm going to say, but specifically, specifically when we talk about ayahuasca, we don't have standardized preparations of ayahuasca so far. This is one thing that my group has a plan to, to, to do in the future in Brazil. But um, at the moment, you have to get a donation of ayahuasca, and then you have to measure, measure the active ingredients, and then you're going to have some sort of idea of which type of ayahuasca you have. And, and we 
all these studies that we say ayahuasca, we're not talking about the same ayahuasca actually, so we have to keep that in mind. Also, we have this variation. Some studies are working with the liquid form, and some studies are working with leophilized, freeze-dried freeze -dry, dry ayahuasca. Um, also, we have still, and the last talk was very important about that, because it's going to clarify more things about this substance that we always say psilocybin, but it's psilocin, the, the real um, substance that's operating. And this difference, the small difference we find from injection and from oral, and then we have this discussion about the possibility that there is a vascular effect of injected, uh, so this, this is a hypothesis that why some differences appear. And then again, this old story, I think this is, uh, you probably have heard uh, that before, but we have to keep in mind that whether, whether it is possible or not to have a placebo um, um, in a, in a setting like that, especially if you have users who are experienced. Talking about that, how does that affect the experiment? Of course, sets, if you're talking about set, we have huge, huge, huge things that, uh, variations of things that we could discuss, but I would like to just to focus on a couple of things that I haven't heard du during the conference, and uh, I think it's important that we remember. Uh, and also, not only the fact that how we, we select, if they are naive or they're experienced. Um, sometimes this is a methodological issue. If you're gonna have a, a liquid ayahuasca, the person does, must not know which, how does it taste, so we can receive a, he or she can receive a, a liquid that is foul tasting, but it's not ayahuasca, and it's very characteristic. Once so you drink it, you never forget. And, and also, many of these studies um, which are these um, subjects of these studies? Most of, many of them have friends or colleagues in the laboratories, and they are talking about a very specific kind of human. They're talking about scientists. Are they normal? And psychedelic scientists. scientists. Um, also, it's important that we remember that the technological apparatus is going, is going to interact with the, the person, and so we have descriptions in many studies about how the humming of the machine influenced hallucinations or ideations or visualizations and whatever. Um, how we deal with the question of movement when, during data acquisitions. We heard, have heard about important papers where sub, uh, subjects' data had to be thrown away because of that. Um, and how, and then we have to think about it because, uh, and I, I do have to think about it because I'm a clinician, how are we going to work that with patients? So how, how far we go? Do, they, do we measure their blood? It's ethical to put them inside a machine during a therapeutic session, this kind of thing. And we see when it's, we look at the papers, at the focus changes because the, the time interest has been changed as well. The first studies are focused basically in psychotomimetic properties of psychedelics, how they would explain or mimic uh, psychosis. I'm not saying that this is worthless. There's still, of course, a gain we can learn from that, but we can, there are more things that we can learn from psychedelics. And then, of course, there was a time where uh, a psychedelic was offered, and then with, a, for instance, ketinserine, there's block that blocks serotonin 2H receptor, and then you're going to see which kind of effect is going to present without ketanserine or with ketanserine, and there was, a, there was a time, and of course we still have to do this time of, it's, it's accumulate, it accumulates. We don't reject the formal perspectives, perspectives we accept them, and, and now we are discussing the quest for consciousness. This is, was, was present all the time, probably, but now we can speak more freely about it, I suppose. Uh, and also the therapeutic interest is, none of these studies is therapeutic by itself, supposedly, but it cites this question, it's, it becomes important in the field. Um, so what about the results uh, themselves? And I'm going to be very, very quick about it, very brief. And I'm going to present this uh, data about localized areas, and I think it's, I recognize that this is very limited, just the activation of one area or the other area and, and the, the data is scarce. If you take all the data from all the studies, you have some coincidences, I'm going to stress them, but you have 
like pinpoints here and there of different areas that are activated or deactivated during the different psychedelic perspectives. And um, I'm using uh, this model from Kubes, Arendt, and Lemoal about addiction and, and behavior of addiction. And if you have any different uh, suggestions about it, I'm happy to hear about it. Uh, where it is the, uh, the, the, the systems are divided, and the system that is mostly activated during binging behavior, during craving behavior, which is in green, binging in blue, and red, uh, the, the, the area that are um, that, uh, affected by uh, situations of withdrawal. Regarding binging, we have dorsal striatum and, and the asterisk shows a, a, an area that has been um, presented in one of the studies, at least one of them. Dorsal striatum, or at least striatum, thalamus, globus pallidus, we don't have any study. The nucleus accumbens, and the nucleus accumbens is green, it's, it's blue and red because it's related to binging and withdrawal. Uh, the expanded amygdala, there is a study that shows alteration in the amygdala itself and not the expanded amygdala. The hippocampus, and we have studies about the parahippocampal gyrus. The insula, the orbital frontal cortex, and the prefrontal cortex, which is it's a, a very uh, ample way of talking about this area, but we have studies that do present uh, correlations with these areas. But what I think it's most important for us to talk now, it's about the default, default mode network. And uh, we do know that, and we have heard in many presentations that, uh, yesterday uh, and today, that it is deactivated with psychedelics, and it, it is linked to self-reflective phenomena, and it is disrupted in mental disorders in different ways. We always say about depression and the augmentation of, of, of the reinforcement of this area, um, in, uh, in depression, and we correlate that with rumination, but the fact is that in different um, mental disorders, there are different patterns, and it's specifically in the case of um, addictions, we have very conflicting data, and um, di di uh, different data for different substances, and it's very uh, hard to interpret this data so far. Few studies as well. But in, by the, in alcoholism, in alcohol-related disorders, we, ha we have a more clear pattern where um, DMN is hyperactivated during abstinence, and um, if this abstinence or withdrawal is stronger, the DMN is more activated. It is decreased when someone who has alcohol-related disorder, uh, of course, compared to placebos, placebo to control, sorry. Um, uh, it is decreased when alcohol is taken, and we have the most consist consistent data considering anecdotal, uh, retrospective studies, the meta-analysis with LSD. Alcohol seems to be, uh, in my opinion, the best option for us to explore uh, uh, the treatment with psychedelics. Also, tobacco. Um, also, we have to keep in mind, and of course, I was preceded with someone much more um, experienced than myself to talk about it uh, during the, 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 the conference, the previous conference, um, about the importance of mystical experiences in this situation. How, we, we still don't know how strong has to be this kind of experience for uh, someone to change his or her behavior regarding an addiction. We do imagine that it takes, it must, it, it, it might be very important. In my opinion, that's how we could uh, uh, understand that. This has been better numerically, evidentially based, demonstrated with psilocybin, but therapists and people who have experience in dealing, sitting psychedelic session, sessions, they also acknowledge the importance of these experiences for anyone who's undergoing therapeutic uh, psychedelic, um, psychedelic therapy, but also specifically for uh, drug addiction. Um, we have some hints now about what might be connected to ego dissolution and how that, that may inflict, and we, we have now to go on and, and try to understand the outcomes of that, 
of the magnitude of that. And, and I also think that this is something that meets the eye of the beholder. Um, many of us um, psychedelic scientists understand that as very impor important. In, in our experiences we had with psychedelics. So I also think that we have to be careful about it because many of us had, in, you name it the way you want, peak experiences, uh, mystical experiences, whatever, and it, it was important for us, it doesn't mean it's going to be important for everyone. But it might be important for some people, definitely. Another thing is about visual cortex, and this is, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm finishing, but by, by the data that is most clearly evidenced, uh, which is the activation of the visual cortex, and people seen with eyes shut, well, with LSD, seen with eyes shut, with ayahuasca. Um, so one point I would like to stress here is sometimes this is seen just as a side effect, and, but we have to remember that the visualizations that are presented, whether real or not, there was a question about if what is, was seen was real or not, and classical therapy many times uh, is not going to, to discuss that, but it's going to work with the patient. What does that mean to them? what importance and why that happened. It's more or less the same question uh, as asking if uh, a dream was real or not. You're going to work with the dream and try to, take, to make as, uh, the best you can from this material that comes from the hyperconnectivity that emerged, probably emerged from the psychedelic state and provided something that can be worked on therapy. How can we standardize that. And the other thing is, uh, uh, Richard had mentioned that, we have to be very careful about the word hallucinations. We, in, in psychiatric and psychopathological terms, most of the times we're talking about hallucination in the studies, we're not talking about hallucinations. We're talking about illusions or inner visualizations and in mental imagery, whatever. To conclude, what I think about the future directions. I think it's interesting that we have a, a, a more closer look on regular users of ayahuasca or, or psychedelics, but in a, I mean, in a real regular basis, we're not talking about ayahuasca drinkers because they go every other week to drink ayahuasca, so it's very regular. It's part of the routine of the dogma. So, of course, you have other things. They, they, in their doctrine, they are recommended not to drink alcohol. So it's influenced by that as well, of course. But it's interesting that we have a look on that. And, for instance, the Netherlands have uh, a great potential on that because ayahuasca is legal for ritual use here. Uh, more DMN and connectivity studies in this population and with uh, addicts or people who use drugs, misuse drugs, um, the psychosocial impact of the uh, symptoms, special the visions, as I told, and of course the importance of mystical and peak experiences in addiction. And I'm talking, of course, in this, all these situations, I'm talking about addiction. And obviously, more clinical trials, mixed experimental and clinical approaches, depending, of course, on the ethical boundaries of, that we are going to respect, of course. Uh, uh, one very interesting thing about this field is that we are redeveloping tools for the interconnection of pharmacological approaches to psychotherapeutic approaches. And it is very exciting that we can work about, up, upon this. It's something really new. And we have the role of music, the role of visualizations, we have the role of art, everything that has been tried for alcoholics, but now we can do that with psychedelics as well and see and measure and evaluate. So this building here was a craft school. And uh, it is written on the, on the sculptures on, on the side uh, uh, that were made for Hildo, for, uh, by Hildo uh, Krop, a famous sculpture of uh, Amsterdam. It is written, and you pardon my, my, my Dutch, something like Zonder Moeti Niet, which means more or less not without effort, or nothing comes without effort. And that's why, that's why we're here, that's why we are joining together our efforts to understand better, and we'll do it better if we do it in a very uh, integrative 
and interdisciplinary way. Thank you very much.